A pleasant day for each and everyone. We are the group one, and today we are going to discuss the nature and scope of philosophy of education. Just for a glimpse, I will discuss what is the significance of this subject. But before I proceed, those anyone have their thoughts or ideas regarding the significance of philosophy. The philosophy of education is defined by the standard encyclopedia of philosophy as the branch of applied or practical philosophy concerned with the nature and aims of education and the philosophical problems arising from educational theory and practices. So, this is the introduction of our lesson for today. Philosophy of education not only critically evaluates the values but also systemize them in hierarchy. Educational values are determined by philosophical values. Educational values propagated by different philosophers have been derived from their own world view and their outlook on the purpose of human life. A philosophy of education refers to the examination of the goals, forms, methods, and meaning of education. The term can be used to describe the fundamental philosophical analysis of these themes and analysis of practical pedagogical approaches. Understanding the philosophy of education will teach them the need to know the whys, along with the intellectual development of the student. It will also improve the standards of our society and make us more rational. Now let's proceed on our learning objectives. So at the end of the unit, we will be able to first, understand the nature and scope of philosophy of education. Second, identify the three functions of philosophy of education. Third, explain the importance of philosophy of education. Fourth, differentiate the student-centered philosophy and teacher-centered philosophy. And lastly, Determine the relationship between philosophy of teaching and its teaching style. Philosophy is the study of general and fundamental problems such as those related to truth, nature, awareness, beliefs, meaning, mind, and language. Philosophy comes from the Greek word philosophia that is possibly invented by Pythagoras who was a Greek philosopher and mathematician. Philos means loving and sophos means wise. Philosophia literally means love of wisdom or friend of wisdom. So what is philosophy all about? And how is philosophy? It's a natural thing we do that we didn't even notice that we're probably doing it without even noticing or knowing. More than anything else, philosophy, it is about thinking. Philosophy was broken up into several subfields. It has been chronologically divided into ancient and modern philosophy, with the subject, the key topics being epistemology, logic, metaphysics, ethics, and aesthetics, and by style, analytical philosophy. There is a collection of similar values behind every school and every teacher, a philosophy of education that determines what and how students are taught. Every school and every teacher have different core values because, obviously, every school has its own culture that expresses their shared values and expectations for students, faculty, and staff. Core values or values are the heart of every school's, and this is what they are stand for. The school values provides the foundation for building the type of atmosphere they want to foster. A well-established core values can help strengthen a school community and help school to build or achieve its vision, its mission, standards, and desired outcomes. Yeah. Educational philosophy answers the question about what is the purpose of learning, and how and what method should be taught by teachers to their students. Education philosophy is a set of educational beliefs and core values that focuses on the purpose and objectives of educational planning, programs, and processes when it comes to teaching and inspiring students to learn. It may influence what and how subjects are taught. Philosophy of education may refer to either the academic field of applied philosophy or any of the educational philosophies that advocate a specific form or vision of education 
or investi and or investigate the nature, aims, and significance of education. As an academic field, philosophy of education is the philosophical study of education, and its issues, its central focus is education, and its methods are those of philosophy. And now here is the thing. Philosophy education and education philosophy are different from each other, so let's not be confused. The philosophy of education is the study of the aims, means, and values of education. It is not a specific educational approach, but rather a framework for thinking about education as a whole. While in educational philosophy, on the other hand, is a specific approach to education that is adjusted based on a particular set of beliefs. About the nature scope and function of philosophy. The scope of the education philosophy includes critical assessment of goals, ideas, and education, analysis of human nature, educational values, knowledge theory, and the relationship between education and social progress. Education philosophy tends to have three functions. The first function is speculative. The speculative role of education philosophy is to explore and investigate and to shape theory about education, its causes, and nature. It attempts to make a survey of the entire region when doing so. The next function is the normative. Normative roles have to do with setting priorities, expectations, and standards. The last function of education philosophy is critical. The critical function consists of a rigorous scrutiny of the words and concepts involved in educational thought and practice. Now, the question arises. What are the problems philosophy of education deals with? In his preface to Indian philosophy of education, R.S. Pandey mentioned some problems which are analyzed by the philosophy of education. And here are Number 1. What is the nature of education? Number 2. Why should education be imparted? Number 3. What is the need of education? Number four, what objectives should education be imparted? And number five, what is the relationship between education and philosophy? Aside from the scope of philosophy of education, there are also three functions of educational philosophy, namely speculative, normative, and the critical function. In speculative function of philosophy, we try to find an underlying explanation or general principle that could explain reality. We make speculation or we synthesize facts and bits of knowledge gathered from different sources. In speculative function, we try to understand the whole issue of education and to formulate it in a basic description by means of research. Let's say that whatever the education arises or whatever questions that education arises, it is going to be answered by philosophy. Let me give you a certain scenario. Let's say, for example, the different schools or universities have difficulties in learning. What should they do? To be able to solve that, we need to assess what does that school or university lack of. For example, the problem is absence of curriculum. We can ask now, what type of curriculum should we impart in that school or university? So for that particular state, if you're going to apply this curriculum, then we must identify first the different needs of that particular society. The next one is the normative function. Normative function, it relates to the formation of goals, norms, and standards. Now that we are done synthesizing, the next thing we should do is to set goals. Besides, there are also educational goals for everything, for every courses or programs. We just need to simplify it to aims. Once we have selected the goal, the leading roadways to that goal is concerned, and that roadways can be the prescription of the textbooks or prescription of syllabus. Once we have this prescription, we can achieve the desired curriculum and the learning of every student. When we try to implement 
the field of education, we need to think multiple times. We need to undergo certain discussions or conferences to that particular society. If it is approved to be in the field of education, since schools and colleges have different rules and regulations. The third one and the last function is the critical function. We are done synthesizing and setting the goals. Now the last part is to scrutinize and criticize if the following curriculum is good for that particular institutions. We need to know if that curriculum suits that class. Will it be fostered or not? Criticism play a large part in the function of philosophy of education since it will analyze if the goals are suitable or not and if we don't give thorough analysis for that it would be all useless these are some of the questions arises in philosophy of education since i don't have much time importance of philosophy of education teachers are mentors who play an important part in inculcating students critical thinking yes to do as a teacher you have to have your own teaching philosophy Students often look up to the instructors and so it becomes important for you to have a positive thoughts. Here are specific reasons why if you are a teacher, you should study philosophy of education. First, help to decipher the path of learning. Philosophy of teaching is like a map that provides directions to move forward. Teacher's job is to help children reach their destination by understanding their, post their purpose as a teacher. So, Teaching need to have a map, map that can lead or help the students to reach their destination and it will be the path for them to learn and understand what they need to learn. And the teacher is the one who guide the learner for that path. It is not possible to make students learn something until the teachers know why and how he or she wants to teach. Once you know your path, you will be helping your students to plan reach their destinations. And next, affects the society. Teachers are role models for the students. Whatever they do, students will follow their philosophical beliefs. Understanding the educational philosophy will help the society and the students to be more rational. So, the teachers are the name community's future builder. The teachers are the one who build the future of the students. What the teachers plan to them will grow. As a teacher, you need to build a quality education by giving the students a quality of teaching. People like you are the ones who help students choose different professions and identities. A teacher can leave a profound impact on students and help them make independent decisions in the near future. So now, we have another importance of philosophy of education which is to be in their shoes. When we say to be in their shoes, as an educator, we should always evaluate not only the behavior and or capabilities of our students, but also how they see themselves. Because most of the times, students view themselves opposite to how we teachers view them. Example, even though we see that the learner is doing well in the class, he or she thinks that he or she is not doing well. Maybe because of her past experiences or some other factors that lead them to think in that way. If we put their shoes to us, we can understand them very well because we already knew him or her inside and out. When we already understand our students' behavior and perspective, we can think of variety of teaching methods on how we can improve their learning outcomes. Next, we have to avoid being judgmental. Being a teacher is like having the power to assess every student's weakness and capabilities. In order to do it, a teacher must also have each and everyone's character. If a teacher had 50 students, he or she must have 50 different characters to match his or her students for him or her to understand them better. We should not judge our students based on how they interact or behave inside the classroom. Because as we all know, nobody is perfect but everybody can learn in different way. We should always not judge a slow learner because maybe they are experiencing something very hard for them or someone is bullying him or her. Like for example, a student who always thinks that he or she is bobo or slow or mangmang and say that he can't do it instead of lowering their self-esteem, we, 
teachers must boost their confidence and encourage them that if they really wanted to do it, they can do it and they will make it. We should always consider that our students have different skills, characters, and style when it comes to learning. If we help them overcome their difficulties, you're not helping them but you're also helping yourself to avoid being judgmental. Because even though you see your students having different capabilities and skills, you treat them equally, thus helping them to develop their potential abilities. As what we're experiencing now, we the students always prefer on our teachers for the knowledge we acquired that we may use to our future profession. So as a future teacher, we must always come up to inspire our future students that our words may serve as an encouragement for them to keep the flame of education burning. So another importance why the future educator needs to learn the nature and scope of philosophy of education is to teach the concept of unification. So from the word itself, unification, that derives from unity, teachers and students bonding and collaboration makes learning process easier and more effective. So through its one goal that makes them unite as one whole body in order to guarantee the smooth process and harmony inside the classroom, we, the future educator, also learn to catch up with our students. So positive interactions between teachers and students improve the learning process inside the classroom and help learners with their emotional, physical, and even the developmental aspects. So we all know that the role of a teacher is to teach, but more than that, the teacher who can build collaborative and unified classroom can inspire. So lastly, learning philosophy of education is important because of the verdict or the judgment. So you might indeed ensure that your children enhances maturity and understanding on a basis of moral standards of conduct while at the same time maintaining this scholastic learning throughout all of his courses by having him study philosophy of education. So as an educator, we make decision using our professionalism in order to bring up together the education system in a meaningful way. We are about to use our professional knowledge, training, and even awareness of the circumstances circumstances of respective classroom and pupils as well as creative judgment. So as we go into the school daily to teach our future students, we can get or we can picture it up what the student's true capability than just an academic test as what we've experienced in the midst of online learning. In the teacher's measurement of intellectual capacity of student is through test and written activities. Unlike in face-to-face, -face, the teacher can measure the whole capability of students through daily interactions. So learning how to judge and how to create best decisions is one of the importance of learning philosophy of education as it helped the students to be more confident and independent through letting them to explore their own self and solidifies their values. The teacher-centered philosophy. Let's talk about essentialism. Essentialism is posed by William Bagley and James Kerner. Essentialism means essence precedes existence. Before you were born, there was a life that was destined for you. Your essence, your purpose, comes before your presence, meaning that before you were born, there was already life for you, like it is destiny. Uh, like for example, you want an iPhone because it have a good camera, but you ended up with Android phones because you didn't afford the iPhone, so it means it is destiny. Um, in teaching, there is already life prepared for everyone. The role of the teachers is to teach learners the basic knowledge skills and values traditional approach or back to basic approach that emphasize the basic skills or fundamental four r's which is reading writing arithmetic and right conduct four r's are needed for the students to acquire higher or more complex skills needed in preparation for adult life so the teacher job is to acquire these four basic skills because according to essentials if the students acquire these four essential skills it would be very easy for the student to acquire the higher or more complex skills in preparation for adult life. Nothing is more important than teacher is teaching student the basic inflammation and nothing is more important than 
the academic growth of the students. Why teach? Teacher-centered, everything comes from the teacher. Teachers, fountains of knowledge, paragon or virtues. Emphasis, mastery of subject matter. So how teachers will do it? Rely heavily on the use of prescribed textbooks, the drill method, the lecture method, memorization, and discipline. So if the, to if the student's textbook is thick, the teacher should make sure that all the topics in the textbook know how to discuss and master properly. Another teacher-centered philosophy is perennialism. Perennialism is an educational philosophy focused on teachers that focuses on the timeless concepts and universal truths learned from art, history, and literature. It aims to ensure that students acquire understandings of the concept of knowledge and the meaning of knowledge as it aims at teaching students ways of thinking that will secure individual freedom. Perennialism was formulated by Thomas Aquinas during medieval period in his work The Magistro or The Teacher and was then supported by Robert Hutchins who developed Great Books program in 1963 and Mortimer Adler who further developed the curriculum based on 100 Great Books of Western Civilization. Perennialist believes that truth is universal and does not depend on circumstances of time, place, and person which they call it transcendent truths and values. Perennialism suggests that the focus of education should be the ideas that have lasted for centuries, believing the ideas are still relevant and meaningful today as when they were written. That is why curriculum of perennialism are all lifted from the great books, a collection of literature considered to be fundamental, significant, and important in Western culture regardless of the time period. Such books include the works of Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, and Shakespeare because they believe past ideas are still relevant and that explains why we still study history, religion, literature, and the laws of science because these universal ideas have the potential for solving problems in any era. And perennialism may appear like essentialism in a way that the perennialism focuses on personal development as its first stage while essentialism focuses on essential skills development. Understanding essentialism will enable you know and improve basic teaching skills and perennialism will allow you as a teacher to continue operating in the success of methods, concepts, and, the, and best practices that were used in education over time. Perennialism teaches ideas that are everlasting. You can remember the word perennialism by remembering that perennial means lasting for many years. The focus is to teach ideas that would last a lifetime to seek the happiness of truths which are constant. And here are some key points for us to easily understand or remember perennialism. First is why teach. The goal of perennialism is to teach students to think rationally and develop minds that can think critically. Teaching these unchanging principles is critical since humans are rational beings. Their minds undergo development and their capacity to think makes it possible to get them engaged in any process which eventually results to changes. A perennialist classroom aims to be closely organized and well-disciplined environment which develops in students a lifelong quest for the truth. Next is what to teach. In a perennialist class, lessons are all lifted from classic and great books. Perennialists believe that education should summarize a prepared effort to make these ideas available to students and to guide their thought processes toward the understanding and appreciation of the great works, works of literature written by history's finest thinkers that transcend time and never become outdated. There is also a less emphasis on vocational and technical education and more on the humanities. This is because perennialism focuses first on the personal development, therefore teachers should teach principles not facts. Since people are human, one should teach first about humans, not machines or techniques. Last is how to teach. Perennialist classrooms are teacher-centered, in which the teacher is less concerned with student interests and does not allow substantially dictate what they teach. The focus of perennialism as a philosophy of education is for personal development of the students or learners through inculcating in them the principles that have been passed from generation to generation. 
principles that were formulated by the great thinkers and philosophers of the past like Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato, and are likely to make one develop a good personality and morality if learned and applied in life. That is also the reason why students engage in Socratic dialogues or mutual inquiry session to develop an understanding of history's most timeless concepts. Just remember that perennialism focuses on everlasting ideas and universal truths. Student-centered philosophies Progressivism It is focused on constructive improvements and problem-solving approach that can be offered by individuals with various educational qualifications. Progressive educators Based on result and don't just impart learned information. Learning is a process of acquiring knowledge or information. Teachers are less concerned with passing on the existing culture and aspire to allow students to build an individual approach to the task they are given. Learning by doing. The children learn the best when they are pursuing their own interests and satisfying their own needs. The next slide, we will see the leading minds of progressivism. They are John Jacques Rousseau and John Dewey. Let's know more about John Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau believed that people are inherently decent and that society is responsible for their corruption. He advocated nature education away from ZD and society pressures, where the needs of the child should drive the curriculum. In this slide, let's talk about John Dewey. John Dewey believed that people learn best through the social interaction and problem solving. He introduced the scientific problem solving approach and experimentalism. Progressivism was not formed into a formalized, recorded philosophy of education because of the diverse view of arising from the movement. Progressives also decided they are needed to step away from those aspects of conventional schools. Okay, next. Let's talk about progressive classrooms. Progressive classroom is about creativity and discovery. Learning by doing. This is basis for experiential learning theory. Experiential learning theory focuses on the idea that the best ways, the best ways to learn things is by actually having experiences. Those experiences then stick out on your mind and help you to retain information and remember the facts. For example, growing a garden to learn about photosynthesis instead of watching a movie about it. Another, in progressive classroom, teachers serve as facilitators where the students explore physical, mental, moral, and social growth. Teachers usually move freely among the classes, using feedbacks and thought-provoking questions to guide them. So what is Reconstructionism? Reconstructionism, also known as Social Reconstructionism, this theory claims to be the true successor of progressive and declares that the chief purpose of education is to reconstruct society in order to meet the cultural crisis brought about by the social, political, and economic problems. And it's also an educational theory that sees schools as a tool for solving social problems. The Reconstructionist classroom contains a teacher who involves the students in discussion of moral dilemmas to understand the implication of one's actions. Students individually select their objectives and social priorities and then, with guidance from the teacher, create a plan of action to make the change happen. One of the examples of social reconstructionism is the 2007 movie Freedom Writers. If you know that movie, the teacher there was determined to get students interest by requiring them to write. Students were allowed to write about anything they wanted. And were free to express themselves in their journal, journal however they please. The journal writings not only taught basic writing skill in some individual instances, it helps to bring students out of a life of crime. 
Another example the teacher will do an activity and his or her activity is to let students read an article about racism. It is possible because you can raise awareness and tips to prevent unintentional or intentional racism. Or it can also be collaborative groupings, like if there is someone who is a victim of racism, they can speak up on how they cope up, cope up with it and how do they deal with such things. In that case, we we listener can possibly think that racism is different as much as what we are seeing. So, that will have an impact to the listeners, classmates, or students to be able to raise a long-term awareness. So, social reconstructionism is all about philosophy of education that looks to education to change society rather than just teach about it. As an education philosophy, it calls on school to educate students in ways that will help society move beyond all forms of discrimination to benefit of everyone worldwide. Existentialism This is the examination of the existence and purpose of an individual group. The questions here are, why I exist, how did I exist, and what is the purpose of my existence in this world? questions that we cannot answer until we experience our life first and we need to know ourselves for us to understand our purpose and why we exist. The answer cannot be said or come from others. We can know it based on our own perspective or experience. Based on Jean Paul Sartre, existence precedes essence. So if we exist, of course there is a reason or purpose. For example, now that we are in our third year of college and are taking the education course, at the point in our lives today, we can somehow answer the question, why do we exist and what is our purpose? Just by choosing our course, we can say that, that's why I exist because I will become a teacher. I have something to contribute in the field of learning. Existentialists want to change something about education. They believe that something, no matter how long you teach, no matter how many times you say it, the question is still there. Did a student learn? Let's notice why nowadays some students hardly know how to respect Po and Opo are disappearing to those students talking who are older than them. Even though it is taught from our lowest level until the next years of our studies. But still, they don't apply it to themselves, even though they know it is right to show their respect. Maybe because they don't see or hear it in their home or in their surroundings. Of course, if in his home, he doesn't hear anyone talking or doing the things taught in school, how can he do that or apply it to himself, right? The student's mind can be confused by doing between what he learned and what he saw. But because learners has a choice, like what existentially said that a man is capable enough of creating his own life and to do whatever he wants in life, so teaching or telling him what to do is still based on his choice at the end of the day. So the students will choose to do what he think and feel that is right. It is also important for the student to learn in a way that is based on his own understanding so that student will become responsible on their actions, feelings, and thoughts because they are the one who make choice in their lives, so they cannot blame to anyone else. There are things that we cannot learn until we see it in real life or until we experience it in ourselves. The relationship between philosophy of teaching and teaching style. The relationship between the two is that the educational philosophy and teaching style is both influenced the process or way of teaching and learning in universities or colleges. Why? Because it says here that the philosophy of teaching will offer or provide the teacher methods and strategies in implementing the adult's learning ideas. It includes the student-centered philosophies and teacher-centered philosophies. Under the student-centered philosophies are progressivism and social reconstructionism, and also ex- existentialism, while in teacher-centered philosophies are perennialism and existentialism. This means that the teaching philosophy is a statement that explains your approach to teaching and how you will apply that strategy 
in the classroom. Well, the teaching style describe how teachers manage their classroom and deliver the content of its subject. We familiarize with the traditional teaching styles that's above. We are gathering our class in online platforms in the past two years. That's why teachers are encouraged to adjust their teaching styles to student learning needs. Also because the teaching approach are determined by the teacher's choice or needs of the students and the subject, the, te the teaching styles help to design a successful learning environment for the student. Again, the philosophy of teaching and teaching style are related to each other because they are both fundamental in the student's learning process. So this time we will talk about one of the questions a teacher will philosophically answer and that is what is the nature of the learner? When we say nature of the learner, it refers to how each learner learns. And now for that question, the terms Lacayan and Platonic will be described in terms of continuum extremes. The term Lacayan comes from John Locke who wrote the essay concerning human understanding. According to him, our mind is most delineated by the idea tabula rasa or blank slate. And all of our knowledge comes from experience or perception. Let's say we are born in this world without knowing anything. We are like a blank white paper or blank wax tablet, void of all characters without any ideas. And we can only fill that blank paper by learning through experience. Why? Because we were filled with ideas as we experienced the world through external five senses and the internal senses of imagination and memory. The information we gathered when we see, hear, smell, touch, or taste something represented true source of information. And any learning by internal operation of our minds perceived and reflected on by ourselves is that which supplies our understanding with all more complex information. Experience is really the best teacher and it is necessary to build who we are and what we are today. So the best example here is that the practicum or also called internships or work placement programs of every fourth year college students. Practicums are designed to make the students apply their learning in the real work setting and to provide students with practical work experience. They emphasize the importance of learning by doing or by experiencing it. So how do teachers learn to teach in front of the class? They learn because they experience it first. If we only learn through discussion on how to be a teacher, we will not have really understand it. We were only capable to input learning from the experiences, failures, references, and observations. Another thing is, why do companies hire employees with more years of experience? They hire um, employees with more years of experience because they believe that the more experienced you are, the more you are knowledgeable to do your job. So now, platonic is a term in which teachers do not want their students to absorb the subject matter itself or to memorize the facts. They let the learners contribute and participate to the learning environment because of the knowledge buried within their souls. Students are the most important ingredient of the classroom environment. So they let their students interact, exchange ideas with them, or teach them and the other students about things that are meaningful to them. They let the students interact with others because it is the only way the knowledge which is locked inside them can be released. Nature of subject matter. The words amorphous or structured are used to delineate extremes regarding the essence of subject matter in the teacher's view spectrum. The word amorphous label has been reserved for rote learning, stressing that any item to be learned is of equal value to any other item to be learned. Thus, young people are not allowed to identify connections between items to be learned and no item is deemed to be more important than the other item. The nature of subject matter concerned on how students can learn and develop their comprehension over the things they are unfamiliar with and to broaden their knowledge on specific topic. It is said that it is expected to see the other extremes structured stance portrayed by those who have a very reasonable view of what the subject matter will never achieve. 
So an educator should have an extensive understanding about the topic that will be imparted to their students. Subject matter is the topic that is written about, talk about, ideas to be discussed and understood. But teachers should know that teaching is not basically relying on subject matter. Instead, be a teacher who shared and used their expertise to help the learners absorb necessary informations and the content of the subject. Bruner's idea is that any subject matter should be regarded as having a natural structure that can be used to clarify the relationships between the, its components and to discover new knowledge. He believed that students can learn by discovery. The concept of discovery learning implies that students construct their own knowledge for themselves. So the teacher's role is to feed their curiosity by correcting misconceptions and the wrong knowledge they have. Moreover, when teachers and learners grasp the structure of the subject, it enables them to relate the other subjects that before seemed unrelated. Remember that it is always important to check the subject matter as it has a big impact on pupils' outcome of their academic performance. How should subject matter guide students with learning activities? The continuums to endpoints are cognitive and affective. Such definitions are not categories which are mutually exclusive, but rather questions of importance and expectations. It is important to include the following addendum in order to illustrate factors involved in any teacher's decision to prioritize cognitive or affective learning practices. Educators use the domains to assist in determination of learning objectives essential to planning, implementing, and evaluating teaching learning processes and outcomes of human learners across the lifespan. Cognitive domain is about fact, concept, and generalization. Learning helps develop an individual's attitude as well as encourage the acquisition of new skills. The cognitive domain aims to develop the mental skills and the acquisition of knowledge of the individual. The cognitive domain encompasses of six categories which include knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. Affective domain refers to belief and value. The affective domain includes the feelings, emotions, and attitudes of the individual. The categories of affective domain includes receiving phenomena, responding to phenomena, valuing, organization, and characterization. There is sample evidence that students bring behaviors that affect how they interpret reality, definitions, and generalizations into the classroom. Often, teachers are fortunate to have students who bring positive attitudes toward the subject, matter at hand with them. Quite frequently, we have students who do not carry really good attitudes with them. Under these circumstances, the task of teachers would be to help students think critically by turning generalization, beliefs, and values into testable hypotheses. The instructor then returns to the affective room. Learning is an essential part of everyone's life. It is essential to growth and development, so both students and teachers must be committed to the process. It is also necessary to ensure that the delivery of learning incorporates the various facets that have been identified as learning domains. With the continually increasing need to ensure that students are taught using a variety of strategies and techniques, teachers must adopt a teaching strategy that combines various domains of learning in order, in order for teaching and learning to be considered effective. Behavior trend in order to carry out one's philosophical position. Two extremes of the continuum are the terms authoritarian and non-authoritarian which should be understood as not simply strict or permissive. These terms should go beyond the classroom management dimension as the classroom management approach is more inclusive. Behavior trend means as that as an educator, 
they have strategies for classroom management and discipline approaches. But there is also the need to make some allowances for teaching style. It is the behavior of the teacher according to the needs in learning of the students. There are two extremes of the continuum or two exclusive strategies called authoritarian and non-authoritarian, but not merely being strict or permissive. These strategies or terms go beyond classroom management because classroom management is inclusive and cover the sustainability of environment while the two extremes of the continuum focuses on how students will learn in the classroom. For example, suppose some teachers allow students to view subject matter only as experts in that field would view it. Thus, for each major question under review, these teachers typically accept only one correct answer which all students are required to accept and understand. And we can conclude that these teachers are meant to promote convergent thought and thus in this sense, we can call them authoritarian teachers. Authoritarian means more teacher control, less student involvement because teacher in this style is centered where students just have to sit and listen without the opportunity to engage in discussions. Teachers who follow this style characterize as too strict just like the given example. Teacher will continue discussing and when a question is raised about the topic, only one correct answer is accepted. That teachers promote convergent thought. Convergent thinking is the process of finding a single solution to any problem, it is finding an answer using logic and facts. Teachers need to be mindful of the philosophical positions they hold and avoid when entering classrooms or preparing to enter classrooms. Philosophical positions influence how they communicate with students and promote learning in person or group learners. Non-authoritarian means less teacher-centered, more students' involvement because in this style, teacher doesn't hold their philosophical positions which is to be the center of the class. Instead, they let the students to express their ideas and focus on the group works. Students can ask questions and teachers with their philosophical positions guide and help their students to learn individually or by group. So we see that the way we react to learner nature questions, subject matter, etc. certainly affects our teaching style. If a teacher is authoritative or non-authoritarian, whether the methods of teaching are constructivist or the style of lecturing are informed by the philosophical position they hold. So, the way how educator responds when students ask questions, discussing lesson, and etc. determine the type of teaching style they apply. Being an authoritarian or non-authoritarian, whether letting the learners to who continue to discuss are based by the philosophical position, whether to be a dictator in the class or to be a guide that will help students. It will be a decision for educator on what style they will use that they think the best for the learners to learn.